Anything that would bring us secular joy, such as electricity, running water, is pulling us away from our relationship with God. The idea is the only joy you should be having is the joy you find in suffering. And the oh, suffering geez. is always for Christ. Oh. <laughs> my dad constructed a paddle. I also remember my dad drilling holes in the paddle and laughing and talking to other people from our church about how it made a whistling sound. This is not discipline. This is literally some up psychological game you're playing yeah. against your own children because you want to hear the whistle before you physically assault your children. I used to wish that someone would kidnap me. Hey guys, my name is Shalise Ansola, and this is Cults to Consciousness, where we discuss leaving high demand religions or organizations and finding healing and independence through awareness and true individual sovereignty. If you're only listening and you want to see our faces, go to our YouTube channel at Cults to Consciousness. It would seriously mean the world if you could just hit that like button, subscribe if you haven't already. Shows me that you are here to support and advocate for these people who are coming forward and telling their stories, being vulnerable. Drop some words of encouragement into the comments it helps them. They read them. I read them. And the algorithm says, oh, I'm going to send this out to more people. So thank you guys for your support on that. Today's guest, this was another person who just blew up on social media. One of you guys sent me her story. And when I found her profile, she was at 10,000 uh, followers on Instagram just talking about her story in the IBLP using the pearls, which is this awful book written by the pearls called to train up a child we're gonna get into what that means guys huge trigger warning on this episode please take care of your mental health we will be talking about child abuse so proceed with caution they sent me her profile and i loved what she had to say as far as speaking up and speaking out about these things we haven't really talked about the pearls yet so i was really excited to get her on the show and before i get into more thank you so much for joining us kendra bryan Thank you so much for having me and reaching out so I can share my story on an even bigger platform. Yeah, you know, it's crazy. So I just saw you're over 30,000 followers now and it's been like three days since I got your profile. <laughs> Yes, like t maybe 10 days ago, I was um, around 1500 followers. And I made one video that I shared on TikTok. And then um, I shared on Instagram. And within 10 days, now I'm at about 35,000 followers. So it's been absolutely incredible. I've just rapidly built this community of supportive and encouraging followers. And I'm just so grateful. Yeah, it's amazing. And it's really just a testament to how your story needs to be told and needs to be heard. Shouted from the rooftop. So we're shouting it out here on Instagram, <laughs> or not Instagram, on YouTube. I know where I'm at. <laughs> um, because more people need to hear about this. And one Absolutely. of the reasons is because this particular book, To Train Up a Child, it focuses on abusing children into submission by methods that we will get into that are very disturbing. And uh, Kendra, your family followed this to the T and actually took it to the extreme. So this is the type of stuff that permeated the households of many people who were involved in the IBLP, which is the Institute in Basic Life Principles. We've done a few episodes on it. We'll definitely link some for you guys. Uh, we're not going to get too far into the weeds about the IBLP because we're going to be focus focusing a little bit more on the Pearl's teachings. But of course, if it comes up in Kendra's story, we'll talk about it. So Kendra, this book, Ugh. can you give us a little bit of kind of a background, some of the things that they say, and then we'll get into detail when we talk about your story? Absolutely. I can give you a lot about this book because it gets me so fired up and upset and angry. And I get very um, animated when it comes to this book because I just, I can't fathom it. So basically, To Train Up a Child is a book written by Mike and Debbie Pearl. They do not identify as being IBLP. However, there's enormous crossover as far as what they believe in um, being uh, evangelical and the IBLP. So their book is a self-published book mm -hmm. that focuses on the extreme nature of what they call child training. And it really focuses on extreme punishment and taking it to the next level of actually being capital punishment, which I looked up yesterday, actually. And interestingly, capital punishment is not illegal when it comes to um, Tennessee, where the Pearls live, mm. Arkansas, where I was raised, and a handful of others 
primarily Southern states. So capital punishment is still legal, which is horrifying. Yeah. Basically, the book my parents got their hands on when I was young. And like you mentioned, they they kind of took it to the next level. One thing I wanted to mention at the beginning of this conversation is the Pearls book has been linked to the death of three children. Oh. When those children passed and the authorities were doing their investigations, the Pearls book was found in all of these households, highlighted, well used, and the parents you know, admitted that they had been using this book. However, the pearls have not been prosecuted and it was never taken off the shelves. Again, they are self-published. So everything that they published, whether it's to train up a child, the various books that they have on dating and marriage, which are equally as horrifying, as well as they have a monthly publication called No Greater Joy Ministries. It's a free magazine, but all of that is self-published um, I receive a lot of questions asking how these books can still be in publication, mm -hmm. how come the publisher is still in business, and that's the reason why, because they're doing it themselves. Mm. Unfortunately, this book is still for sale on Amazon. <laughs> so, yes, yeah, so which is interesting if you go and read reviews, there's they're either five-star or one-star reviews. Um, there's really no in between. So they have their followers going on there and leaving five star reviews. And then people like myself and you who are absolutely horrified and go on and leave very truthful reviews about what the book teaches, as well as the consequences of using the book uh, with your child, with your children. The book was published in 1994. And this has been going on since then. That's horrifying. Correct. Yes. Which is if you look at my family's timeline, that lines up perfectly with when looking back, my parents started implementing these tactics with raising their own children. So this wasn't something that my family partook in like before this book was widely published. So I remember I remember seeing this book in our household. I remember seeing the other Pearls books on bookshelves and on coffee tables. It was it was not just used. It, my parents weren't ashamed to use it, which now as an adult and as a parent myself, I, again, I just cannot wrap my head around it, how you can treat your child that way. Um, much less corporal punishment on your own flesh and blood is beyond me. Yeah. Can you give some hard examples for people who are wondering the level of extreme that they go to in the book? Yes. So whew, it gets heavy. Yeah. <laughs> um. So yeah, I'd be happy. I actually have some quotes that yeah. I was going to read just so it's not taking, you know, it's not just me paraphrasing, but it's actually from their book okay. talking about selecting your instrument according to the child's size. One of the quotes from their book says, so for under one year old, a 10 to 12 inch long willowy tree branch, about one eighth inch in diameter is sufficient. Sometimes alternatives have to be sought. A one foot ruler or its equivalent in a paddle is a sufficient alternative. For a larger child, a belt or a larger tree branch is effective. And then another quote um, says, it is most effective to strike a light rod against bare skin where nerves are located on the surface. Mm. So this is deliberately done to inflict as much pain and breaking down a child's will. And that's that's something that needs to be addressed about the effects of this book is that it focuses on complete psychological domination. Mm -hmm. Everything that Mike and Debbie talk about in the book is 100% about breaking down the will of the child to be in complete and absolute obedience. Mm -hmm. Something else say that, that they discuss in the book is not waiting until your child messes up to discipline them. Because they say your child will inevitably mess up. So what you need to do is train them and discipline them before they even have a chance to mess up. What? So they, again, will act in complete submission and obedience. So that's where some of that crossover comes in with like the blanket training. I know you've yeah. discussed that before with the IBLP. And I believe it was in the Shiny Happy People documentary as well. But it's basically about... Um, tempting your children with a toy or an item that they want or even food sometimes and then punishing the child when they go for that item and preventing them from from getting something. So it's basically good old fashioned entrapment. Yeah, <laughs> you you set something up for your child and you just wait for them to fall into it unknowingly because they trust you and they love you. And so you're giving them something they're going to take it and then when they go to take it, you discipline them because you want to break them down before they you know, can have any type of independence whatsoever. Yeah. And they're doing this to infants. 
That is correct. So in their book, they give an example of using these tactics on a child, one of their own children as young as four months. Mm. But what they instruct in the book is as young as six months. So I remember... I remember my parents using a particular method when it comes to training infants and toddlers, but more specifically infants, is when it comes to taking a nap. And I have another quote in my book about or in their book about that. But basically, when you put your child down to take a nap, if they cry, when you set them in the crib, they are punished. What you want to do is train the baby, the literal baby, to be in complete submission where they shut off all emotion crying oh, no. even when they wake up from a nap you don't want to hear anything and i remember one of my second to the youngest sibling when they were born um my parents using this method on them and how they would be so my parents were so proud of how well they had trained um, my brother for this so they would put him in the crib and he would just i remember i remember i just have like pictures in my head where he would just lay on his stomach in the crib and, you know, his head would be sideways and he was, his eyes would just be wide open, you know, and he would blink, but he would never cry. He would never like show emotion and to break a baby's will <laughs> at that age. I just, I mean, what does that do to their, their brain development and their emotional development as children, but also once they're grown and out in the, out in the world, you know, they focus so much on, having obedient children and children that are well behaved, but at what cost? Are they truly well behaved? Maybe, but but why? Because they're being abused and severely psychologically tortured at home. Mm -hmm. So of course they're going to be well behaved in public. Yeah. And I think something about that too is you're teaching your child how to be controlled, not how to regulate and find connection. Because a baby cries because it has certain needs that it needs to be met, that needs to be met, hungry, tired, whatever it may be, stomach ache. And when you teach them that that's wrong and they just completely disconnect, I would imagine, from their own needs. And it's not something that's self-soothing. They're just learning that they are on their own. And what tends to happen from the research that I've done myself is that when you teach a child to be controlled instead of connected and independent, you just teach them to walk right into an abusive relationship and not know that that's not okay because you're used to that submission and you're used to that punishment. And so it really just sets the child up for failure in the future. Absolutely. that's That becomes their normal baseline. They don't know any better. And I say they, but me included, because that's exactly what happened to me is when I got out of the cult upbringing, uh, upbringing and I literally ran away from home to get out of it, I immediately ran into the arms of someone else exactly like that who was actually connected in the cult in a, in a kind of a different way. But, but that's exactly what it does. And my brother, who I just mentioned, I remember having those vivid memories of him being trained that way. He is, he's the only other kid besides myself that got out of the cult and he has no memories. Like his brain has literally mm. per, like shut off all memories. I think he said, he told me once that his earliest memory is like 13 years old. He remembers nothing because your body does that when it's in wow. traumatic situations to, in order to protect you so you can survive, it will completely just block those memories. So that, I mean, that's case in point, what happens when you take discipline to the absolute extreme as in this case. Um, I wanted to mention real quick another quote from the Pearls book that really upset me yesterday. And, and thank you for your patience with me yesterday. We, The audience doesn't know, but we tried to record yesterday and I ended up not being able to and we had to do it today because I was reading some more things about the Pearls books and it, my body, even though I've been to in a tremendous amount of therapy and I talk about my experience openly, something about talking about this book makes my body absolutely reject <laughs> reject it. Yeah. Like I, I have no control over it. I don't feel like it bothers me on a surface level, but it obviously does because, you know, I had like a horrible panic attack yesterday after I talked about it and or yeah. after I was like just reading about it and um for for over an hour. For over an hour literally just laying on my floor. Like Ooh. that's the that's the extreme. And I've been out 15 years <laughs> and it still affects me to that degree, which 
is wild. You know, I, I'm, I'm ready for it to not affect me, but unfortunately that's again, the level, but something, uh, Michael Pearl has said about his, his methods is that they, and I quote, are adaptable, no matter unique disability or psychological condition, which is so upsetting. Um, I, I was undiagnosed autism and ADHD. Mm. I did not get diagnosed with ADHD till I think three years ago. And I didn't get diagnosed with autism until uh, uh, Halloween this past year, actually. Wow. So not even a year ago. And so I had that growing up and I know several of my siblings did too. And None of that matters because number one, we weren't even given health care or dental care mm. or anything until I was an adult. So I'm still paying the price for not having those services as a child. But furthermore, no one had visibility to see that some of us were struggling with mental health or with disabilities. And my parents certainly that was no reason for them to punish us even less or to try different methods with some of us who were a little bit different. So yeah. Several of the deaths that have been linked to the pearls were of children who had been adopted by couples, like oh. adopted from overseas, and they had mental health difficulties and disabilities. And again, Michael Pearl has stood by his book. He's never been ashamed to say that, his, you know, stand by what he says. In fact, something I read again about him is that he said, there's always parents that take it to the extreme but anytime he's talked about in the news, his Amazon, his Amazon sales spike up. And that just infuriated me wow. that someone could be so dedicated to the bullshit like this, that regardless that three children have died because of your book, because of your teachings and you telling people and instructing people that this is God's way and they take that as truth. You're more concerned about your Amazon book sales going up and that you're going to make more money off of it, off of literal children dying. I just it's disgusting. Oh my gosh. It, it's so revolting. It's it's absolutely horrifying. Oh, what do we have to do to get this book pulled from Amazon? I feel like writing multiple very strongly worded emails to whoever I need to to get this down. Like what how has this not been taken down yet? Yeah. I know that there was a petition circulating. I want to say in like 2017, I could be wrong on the date, but there was a petition circulating. I think it got over like 144,000 um, signatures on it, but it, it eventually went dead and Amazon released a statement saying they weren't going to remove the books for whatever reason. They didn't, I don't believe they actually gave a reason. They just stated that they weren't going to remove the books. So I think now we have a bigger platform since 2017 yeah. or whenever that was originally done. And I think the louder we are and the more we talk about this book and the more angry people get, and rightfully so, we can make a bigger impact because we can make those bigger waves and get the attention of the right people to remove this book because in no world should this be legal, mm -hmm. um, much less celebrated and promoted. Yeah. Absolutely. And there was something that really hit me hard. I'm sure it brought me to tears <laughs> and it, it might now. Um, but if I can put it up on the screen, guys, I will. It was Michael in this big auditorium demonstrating on a rag doll how to hit your children and saying that um, strike your child once and then wait because the psychological torture of them waiting for the second blow can be worse than the actual beating. The mother needs to understand if she takes away her husband's authority, even by a face, even by making like a pitiful look appeal to her husband, she is taking away all authority from that child's life. If that child is going to have authority, mother, you got to let that man be the authority. Punish him with the rod severely. That's what you do to screamers around here. And if you have fun, it'll be a lot easier training. If he screams too hard with the first five gets hysterical, wait. You know, a little psychological terror is sometimes more effective than the pain. Something him on the head? You're worried about that? Give me another question. And it just... Man, it just... it. Uh... I don't even have words. It's so heartbreaking. And for what? Why do you need your child to be completely obedient to you? You don't own that human being. Yes, they're your child, but 
what do you gain from this complete submission of your child? It's just, it's a lot to process. And it really hurts me that some people think that this is the right way. Yes. And it attracts the type of parents that are not only agree with it, but tend to have very narcissistic and sociopathic traits as well. Um, My mother (laughs) would be one of those people. She was one of those people that would hit us with whatever she could find, um, whether that's PVC pipe. Michael Pearl even talks in his book about using PVC pipe, dowel rods that you could get from like craft stores, um, weed eater cord, really whatever you could find. And my mother was one of those people where when she's (laughs) disciplining you, um, if eventually, just like I mentioned with my infant brother situation, we would shut off all emotion. You have to, as a child, you have to go to that place. Even adults go to that place when in horrifying conditions, Mm -hmm. you mentally shut down and you essentially disassociate and go into a place mentally where you can survive until it's over. In my mother's eyes, that was, and it's in the Pearl's book as well. That's a sign of defiance and disobedience. Or if you go to spank your child and they buck or they move or try to get away, that is a sign of rebellion. And they get even more discipline if they show those signs. So my mom, I just remember like she would just get so just infuriated if she was doing that to any of us and we just shut down. Like that would, she just would I just remember that look in her eyes, like she would just rage. Like it just made her so angry that she couldn't break us. Right. Um, and again, I just can't, I just can't grasp. Like, and I'm grateful that I can't grasp to do that to my own child. Mm-hmm. But this type of book and this type of t- tr- teaching and training is so attractive and and godly guidance for people like my mother who are already in that way of thinking and already, you know, thrive off of hurting other people or trying to feel power over people. Um, and this book does a great job of giving you permission through quote unquote the Bible mm-hmm. to do that. And then that way you can't be held accountable because you're actually doing the right thing in their eyes because um, there's a verse in the Bible, beat him with the rod and he shall not die. And that's essentially where the pearls take this. Um, that's how they reference the Bible when it comes to this book and the extreme methods is you're, you're actually doing yourself and your children a favor by beating them and torturing them because they become great citizens and, you know, have work or have do great work for the Lord later in life. I just get so angry when people take a verse out of this book and use it as an excuse to hurt other people. Because what about the verse that says, if thy right eye offends thee, pluck it out? Like, why are we not going, if we're going to use the Bible as a guidebook, why are we not doing that? You know what I mean? Like, we've seen The Handmaid's Tale. We know that it could easily go in that direction if we really follow the Bible. So, when, (laughs) when they cherry pick and even just use one verse to give an excuse for abusive behavior, it just does not sit well with me. So I want to speak more about your childhood and at what point you recognize the shift. Because were you old enough to really, uh, do you remember the difference when they got the book versus when you didn't have the book in your house? I don't remember the exact moment the book appeared, but I absolutely remember the shift. So I would have been around five or six. Um, up until that point, we lived a relatively normal life and and relative in the sense that we wore normal clothing and lived in a neighborhood and interacted with other people, et cetera. And then I remember the first defining moment from, for me was I remember my dad coming home with a goat in the back of his pickup truck. And we were like, why do you have a goat? <laughs> and uh, she was like, well, we're going to have a goat farm. We're going to, we're moving out to another place out in the middle of the country and we're going to raise goats and we're going to have a homestead, which looking back now, homestead is a term that the pearls use mm. and encourage is, is having a homestead. Um, and also my dad made us start calling um, them Papa. So I... <laughs> Sounds so creepy, like when I say it. (laughs) Again, I when I was looking at the Pearls book more recently, they referenced uh, Michael Pearl as Papa, and I was like, "You've got to be shitting me," (laughs) because I never knew, like I never knew why we called my dad Papa Uh and not Dad, you know. And so up until that point, it was just Dad, and then all of a sudden, oh no, you're gonna call me 
Papa. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we did. So we moved out to the country, got a bunch of goats, had a dairy goat farm for years. But my parents also took it to the extreme because they decided that we were going to live without electricity, without running water, again, without healthcare, dental, socializing. I was homeschooled from start to finish, as was my older brother and uh, a couple of my younger siblings. And I use homeschool very loosely because neither of my parents were college educated or had any means to homeschool us in a way where we would learn anything really past probably like seventh or eighth grade. Mm -hmm. So most of our teachings were centered around the IBLP, but Mm -hmm. it was, it was more focused on learning about God um, and, and less about education. So when I did eventually leave home and I went to college, it was a huge culture shock because even the environment of learning, having undiagnosed disabilities, like all of these things play a part into that. So it was just, a complete upheaval of what I thought the world was. But back to the transition into that life. Yeah, so out in the middle of nowhere, uh, no electricity, no running water. I just milked dairy goats by hand twice a day. Um, We actually, (laughs) I was thinking about this last night. We, We built a house to live in, but we built a barn. So the idea was we were going to build a barn for the goats and we were gonna live in that while we built a house, but the house never was built. So we actually just lived in this tin roof barn Whoa. that had like open, it had open loft. So but if you just think about it like that, oh, that sounds really cute. Like, oh, you lived in a cute little barn with open lofts. No, thanks. It was like, <laughs> uh, it was open because we weren't allowed to have privacy or doors or, oh, wow. you know, any autonomy whatsoever. We had to Um, We had like a natural spring that was like half a mile down a hill. So we would go down there with like five gallon buckets of water and like collect water and haul it back up the hill. And that's how we flush the toilet. We had the wood cook stove where we heated water to for the bathtub and we would just share bath water. (laughs) Um, So it was just, yeah, it was very primitive. And, you know, a lot of people are, are doing that now where they like to live off the grid or off the land. But in this case, it wasn't done from that type of perspective of like, oh, we want to get back to nature or enjoy, you know, enjoy nature and, and living more, a, you know, a more s- simple life. Mm-hmm. It was, we need to keep the public away from our children and the children away from the public. And everything is so fear-based. It was, the idea was, you know, when we'd go in public, which was very rare, is like we acted so just shut down. I don't think I made eye contact with a man until I was like 17. I, I did not like eating in front of people until I was like 14. Um, I developed an eating disorder because of this. So um, it was, you know, people would always comment and my parents took a lot of pride in the fact that when we would go in public, people were like, oh my gosh, how do you have seven kids? And they're all so well behaved. Mm. And oh my gosh, I wish my kids were that well behaved, but they don't know what's going on behind the scenes. They don't know that my dad constructed a paddle that was, well, it's about this long, about this wide. Um, And I remember one side was really smooth because (laughs) that's the side we got hit with. And then the other side had just like really rough splinters. The worst part about this is I also remember my dad drilling holes in the paddle and laughing and talking to like other people from our church about how it made a whistling sound when he would drill the holes in it. So, so (laughs) that's why I'm like, this is not, this is not discipline. This is literally some fucked up psychological game you're playing against your own children because you want to, you want to hear the whistle before you physically assault your children. And somehow that brings you some sick joy. Yeah. (laughs) Um, And heaven forbid we move when we hear the whistle. Um, Another big one was belts. And actually, I I didn't realize how bad that sound still affects me. But my son, who's 15, had some friends over a couple weekends ago. And one of his friends like took off his belt and he was just like playing with it. Mm. And I kept hearing that snap. Yeah. (laughs) And I was like, immediately I felt nauseous. I was like, I'm going to throw up. I couldn't like I I didn't even know that it still affected me that way. But that sound because my parents would have my brothers take off their belt Um, so they would use the kids belts to do the inflicting, you know, and then on me or 
the boys and then the boys would have to put the belt back on after they're done but my you know they take off the belt and then my dad or mom would like fold it in half and make that like popping sound yeah it like oh still makes me like sick to my stomach so um and that's like that's at that point things are not being done because you want to train your child in the way of the lord you know that's where they get the voice uh, or that's where they get the title to train up a child is a Bible verse, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Well, I fucking departed from it. <laughs> <I'll tell> you. <laughs> yeah, you did. Um, I've, I don't, I've never spanked my son a day in his life. And he's a great kid, respectful, polite, you know, thinks of others as kind. And more importantly, he doesn't, he's not afraid of me. He's not scared of what I might do to him or no matter how angry I get. There's not going to be physical and mental and even emotional repercussions because I've learned to regulate. And as a byproduct, that's how we teach our children to regulate. Yeah. Um, and that's the biggest gift I can give him is my own healing and my own emotional regulation, which has, which has taken so many years. And it just, I think back to my early years of being a parent to him and you know, I still feel a little guilty. I never hit him, but I just, I didn't know how to emotionally regulate or what to do with these things or how to handle situations. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like, you know, he was robbed of having the best version of me because I was still, I, I had still not accepted the fact that I was even raised in a cult at that point or the amount of um, damage that this book and my parents had caused in my own brain and um, in my life. So yeah. It's just, it's so layered. It, uh, you, but you know what? I need to stop you there because I know that as a mom, you probably do have that guilt, but I just want to congratulate you for never hitting your child. I think that is huge. I think you should give yourself way, way, way more credit than you are now and also know that you were still going through so much when you had this baby and you like you said you didn't know you didn't understand and I think we do the best that we can with the information that we have and the fact that you never did lay a hand on your son is hugely telling and it's so amazing that you were strong enough to do that and so I just have to say amazing work and I'm sure everyone in the comments will agree with that and I also wanted to say I meant to say earlier just Thank you for opening up and sharing this because I know it can be really difficult. And please, if at any point I ask you a question that's a little bit too hard to answer, you absolutely do not need to answer it. Um, I, I just have so many questions about how you were able to get through this as a child and, and if you felt like there were adults around you who could have stepped in and didn't. Do you feel like because you were isolated, you didn't go to public school, there was no one who could no teachers who could advocate for you. So you're isolated in that way. And then you said that you went to church, but I'm assuming that these people at church all had the same approaches if your dad was able to laugh with his friends about the holes he drilled through it. Did you, were you, um, did you show signs of this abuse at church? Were people noticing? Did everyone just think it was normal? Like how, what was that like for you? Yeah, it was completely normal. Um, and also the fact that especially women were dressed from head to toe, you know, floor length skirts, um, you know, all, just everything's covered. So wherever I had been disciplined at, if there were whelps and bruises, which there were oftentimes myself and my brothers, no one's going to be able to see them. And if right. we did, well, what did we do to deserve that? Because obviously mm. we had done something. Um, so it was very normalized. Um so yeah, I don't think I, I used to, I used to like wish that someone would come like, <laughs> this is really weird. I used to wish that someone would kidnap me. Like I, I remember thinking that so many times because I just wanted to be out. And even though everything about the outside world was told to us as being scary and that we were going to be persecuted or being take away from our families or put in foster care and separated. We would never see our siblings again, you know, so all of that's being told to us. So we didn't think to tell anybody we didn't, because number one, we didn't even realize fully that what they were doing was not okay. Yeah. 
But I just knew many times in my childhood, like, I can't, I don't want to do this. I can't do this. Like it, there has, I would rather see how horrible the world is than be here. So I remember wishing that someone would kidnap me or that I would get, I would break a bone so I could be in the hospital just Mm. to see what the public is like. Yeah. (laughs) That's really messed up thinking about it now. Um, And then this is trigger warning, but um, there was one point, you know, I, I even, I like, tr- I tried to kill myself in the bathtub. Mm. I tried to drown myself in the bathtub um, because I was like, I can't, like, I, can't. <laughs> I don't want to do this anymore. But, um, and my, my mom is because I had just gotten into something with my mom and um, I think I was like eight oh my when gosh. I tried to kill myself. And she told me if, if things were so bad here, then I should just not be here anymore. And I should, you know, leave or kill myself. Oh. And so I, I tried to drown myself in, you know, the used bath water. But I remember like, it's kind of like you see in movies where I'm like, I remember like the water coming over my face and me being underwater and just like, it kind of was like everything went quiet and just stopped. And then I just kept thinking if I like if I'm dead, then being second oldest, all of that is going to come down on my siblings. Mm. <laughs> and so they're going to get it worse if I'm not here. And like the guilt, even at eight years old, the guilt that I had of like not being there for my siblings was greater than my want to not be abused, which is what a choice for an eight year old to have to make. Um, so yeah, so I have a tattoo up here for suicide awareness. And that's, <laughs> that's where that comes from. Um, but but yeah, so I I didn't really know the options. Obviously, I didn't know about CPS. I didn't know about, you know, as far as anyone would be able to help me or what resources were available. I just knew that everything that was told to me is that the world was out to get us and split us up and persecute us. And um, I was talking to my brother who, who got out as well. And we both... <laughs> neither of us knew this about each other, but we were like, we never thought we would live to be adults. Like genuinely, I never thought, I always thought the rapture was going to come back. I was always scared, like perpetually scared that the rapture was going to happen. Um, and, or that we were going to get offed for being Christian. Like, you know, the stories that they tell in the Christian settings of like, oh, at, at two children, like you're going to be asked to deny Christ. And what are you going to say? What are you going to say when there's a gun to your head? You know, are you going to deny Christ? And you're sitting there as a child, like in my head, I'm like, I mean, I feel like God would understand like Judas, you know, right. no, didn't Judas betray Jesus? Like, I'm pretty sure he's going to forgive me as a child for like saying, no, I don't believe in God. <laughs> you know? right. But yeah, so none of us thought like none of us thought we would even grow to be adults so sometimes it's surreal i'll be here and i'll be like oh my god like i have a 15 year old i have freedom i have a house like i never thought that i would even get to this point in my life and and sometimes i feel a little lost still like am i doing this right like why am i here i didn't think that this would happen i never thought this far ahead because i didn't think that i would be here yeah (laughs) so it's yeah it's it's still surreal sometimes because of everything pushed into your head is like you know, if you leave, you're basically going to be dead and desolate and unhappy and tortured. And so guess what? It's so much better on the outside. Everything right. they said was a lie. And I've never been happier. You know, I, I don't have a relationship with my mother and that is on purpose. Um, and it's better for me and my son. But unfortunately, my mom and most of my siblings are still heavily involved in that uh, deeply religious and conservative way of thinking in life. And my, some of my nieces and nephews are being raised exactly the way that I was raised. Mm. And it's very heartbreaking. Um, but, you know, I'll, I think the best thing that we can do as people who've been in and got out is I don't ever push my worldly agenda or whatever you want to call it. I never go out of my way to tell them how ridiculous they're being but it's my my goal and my job i feel like is to stay open to the to the idea that eventually one of them may want out also yeah and so i just need to be a safe haven and someone that they feel comfortable um coming to when that moment comes it already happened with my brother Um, my brother and i are 11 years apart but um i left and had so much guilt about leaving but i always had this nagging like feeling i needed to come back to Arkansas to 
be available. I just had a feeling like one of my younger siblings was going to need me and exactly that happened. So I had moved back and within a year or two, one of my younger siblings who was still in high school reached out to me and it was like deja vu because I ended up going to pick him up. He threw Mm -hmm. some stuff in a garbage bag, just like I did. And then he came and stayed with me until he turned 18. So um, I'm very grateful that I could be that person for him. But the strength that that takes as a as a child, as a literal child to make that decision to run away from home for your own safety and mental well-being is just something no child should have to to face. And so I'm enormously proud of my brother for that. (laughs) Yeah, that's really amazing that you were able to be there for him and also have the strength to help him because I'm sure it also brought back some triggering memories for you. And so being able to be that rock while you're still healing is amazing. And I want to get into how you escaped. But before we go there, I'd like to speak on, we spoke a little bit about this off camera, how the reason for not having running water or electricity or living in that way, you had mentioned because they think anything joyful is a sin. And I think that is a really important point to bring up because I'd also like to see how that played into your healing once you got out. So if you wouldn't mind sharing some insight into that, that would be great. Absolutely. So essentially the idea is the only joy you should be having is the joy you find in suffering and the oh, suffering geez. is always for Christ. Oh. <laughs> so the more you suffer, the clo- the closer to Christ you are, the closer your walk to God is. So that was part of the reason for us living in such a weird, like almost like Amish type of um, environment is because anything that would bring us secular joy, such as conven- modern conveniences, l- electricity, running water, is pulling us away from our mission and our relationship with God. And an example of that would be, even as a child, anything that brought me joy was taken away. So um, in my older teen years, my parents owned a restaurant. And although I wasn't paid, obviously, I could keep the tips from working at my parents' restaurant. So I waited tables, kept the tips. And embarrassingly, I was a horse girl. Why is that <laughs> embarrassing? And, yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I wanted a horse like so bad. And so I worked at my parents' restaurant. My dad was like, if you save up the money, you can buy a horse, but you have to pay for it yourself. Wow. You have to build the fence. You have to pay for everything. And that's I was like, lot. that's fine. I'll do it. So I did. So I saved up the money. I purchased this purebred Arabian mare. Wow. Uh, her name was Fancy. And I I loved this horse like so much. We lived next to 13,500 acres of a game and fish reserve. And so I would just hop on this horse and spend like I would do my homeschool for a couple hours in the morning and then hop on my horse and just be gone for hours and hours of the day, just like riding and riding, riding, just brought me so much happiness. Well, my mom decided that wouldn't do. So she sold the horse Mm. (laughs) without telling me, sold the horse. Um, And that was absolutely like, I can't even tell you, it is so devastating. Like that was my peace. That was my time away from the volatile home life and just time with myself. I wasn't going and doing anything to get in trouble. I was literally just riding out in the woods with this, you know, stubborn ass horse. It was the best time. And so that was taken away. Another time I had a dog named Jake. Loved this dog. Um, He was a uh, Springer Spaniel, gorgeous. And we would go out in the woods all the time to chase armadillos, just being country, you know, country as hell. (laughs) And then I remember coming back to the house one day and I'm like, where's Jake? Where's Jake? Where's Jake? And it turns out that my mom had given him away to another family in the church and they like bobbed his tail and like did all that had him fixed. I don't know all this stuff. And I was just, as a kid, I'm just like, like, that's, that's my dog though. Like, and it wasn't hurting anything. Like he's just, he wasn't a troublemaker, but it brought me joy. So, you know, I, I wasn't allowed to have that. I also had a pet chicken named Blackie. I mean, obviously she was black Mm -hmm. and, um, she would like to just sit on the front porch and just hang out there until I would come outside. And then, 
uh, so my parents, ugh, this is like tr- triggering too, but my parents, and again, she wasn't hurting anything. She was just a chill chicken and came back one day and I'm like, where's Blackie? And then uh, come to find out my dad and one of my brothers had taken her out in the woods and like thrown her off like a bluff, like a cliff. Cause she was old and they were like, she, and it was winter and they were like, she's never going to make it. She, I shit you not. This chicken made its way back to the- no. Like, oh my gosh. I about had a heart attack. I, I was know. Like, not the chicken. I know. I know. I was like, what? That's so fucked up. Like, why would you do that? And I have like other just terrible stories that my mom did. My mom just did not like animals, which is a sign of a sociopath. But um, she was not just didn't like animals, but was like really cruel and mean to animals. So but that, those are just some examples of like anything that brought me joy that wasn't costing them any money. It wasn't a hardship on the family, anything, because I was taking care of everything with the horse, for example. It was just like, uh, it's, you know, it's causing her to stray or it's causing her too much joy and we can't have that. She needs to suffer more. <laughs> so, Jeez. but that was, that was just kind of like the philosophy is if, you know, the joy should be in suffering. It shouldn't actually be in joy. And that has translated into my adult life even since I've been out I still have a very hard time resting even Mm. just sitting still and just resting without feeling guilt or anxiousness like those feelings of you know when your mom comes home and something's not done and you're like oh shit let me go set out the hamburger meat or whatever but times a thousand you know um but I still get those like feelings when I'm trying to rest or enjoy myself I always feel like I have to be productive or that I'm dropping the ball on something because feeling joy or rest is still so foreign to my brain and to my body um so things I do now that bring me joy I just tr- I have to be very diligent about almost like scheduling joy mm. <laughs> And that's one thing I would tell other other people who've like come from these types of backgrounds is like you might you might you might not even know what brings you joy yeah. at that point when you get out or even years after you get out. It's all about survival. Even when you get out, it's trying to transition into the real world. So you don't even know what joy is. You feel bad. You feel guilty for feeling joy. Yeah. Um, and so having to be very intentional and schedule moments of joy or moments of happiness or finding things that make you happy or can give you even little hits of serotonin is it's a big deal and we should never feel guilty for that we're put on earth to experience joy and to be happy and those things were robbed of us and we owe it to ourselves and to our children or even if you don't have children we owe that to ourselves alone to have those feelings again and experience joy even if it's for the first time absolutely you deserve to feel joy and i love that you are finding ways to allow yourself to have those feelings now i'm sure it makes a huge difference in your family too and your child has been able to experience a whole different lifestyle because you've really done the work to deprogram and unwind and learn how to become a parent who is uh, connecting and not coercing and not controlling. And I think that says a lot about who you are. And before we move on to how you escaped, is there anything else that you want to mention about your childhood? Yeah, I was actually thinking about a story when we lived out there in the boonies, you know, very off grid um, and not in a healthy way. So my parents would have uh, some of us older kids take jobs to help supplement the income because my parents did not believe in any government assistance, even though we were well, well below poverty level and would have qualified for things that would have given us health care and dental. Mm. They refused to. They, you know, we didn't want the government involved. So I had my first job when I was 10. Wow. Uh, cleaning the neighbor lady's house. I would clean uh, her house for her and take care of her little dog and weed her garden and do flowers and things like that. And I also had my own baking business at that age as well. So we, again, we didn't have electricity. So everything that I baked would be on a wood cook stove, but I would bake it on Thursdays. And then my mom would take me in public on Fridays and I would go to the courthouse and go into like all the offices, like the assessor's office and county clerk. And I would sell like the baked goods. My mom was like, well, no one's going to be able to say no to like a little Amish girl with bonnet and braids. So they would have me do that to help supplement the income. So I wasn't allowed to keep that money. Um, in fact, I remember my parents had, or my grandparents had some like other bank accounts with money in it for some of us older grandkids. And my 
parents took those and used those. Mm. My mom, I didn't know this until I turned, I became an adult, but my mom took out loans in my name um, and completely ruined my credit. And that was before I even knew what credit was. (laughs) So I've spent a large part of my adult life just really digging myself out of a hole that I wasn't even aware was a thing. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't, no one had talked to me about what a credit score was, but um, you know, it's, I don't want to say child labor, although essentially that's what it was, but it's just, it just goes to show how disconnected we were from the world. There were opportunities where people did see me such as our neighbors and didn't report anything or to my knowledge, they didn't, they very well could have, and nothing was done or my parents, you know, explained themselves out of it. I'm not sure. Um, but is we were so far removed from the real world. You know, I, again, I didn't know that that wasn't normal to be 10 years old and, and cleaning houses for neighbor ladies and, you know, having a baking business. And since I was so cute and bonnet and braids, like a little Amish kid, then mm. that was what was selling the product. So right. <laughs> it's just, it's messed up. So they would dress you up in that way specifically to go out and sell things? Or did you always dress that way? They played into it for sure. I was... I don't think I, so when my parents first started that type of lifestyle, I wore regular clothes, like I said, until I was like five or six. At that point, I only wore homemade clothing. I only, all my clothing was sewn and homemade um, or hand-me-down homemades from other people in the church. So, I mean, I looked rough and rugged and I don't really don't know how people didn't call CPS (laughs) because looking back at pictures, I'm like, Oh my God, this is embarrassing. It's so, it's so bad. Um, but my, my mom definitely played, played into it because she knew that that would sell, um, some little girl with a bonnet and braids, you know, cooking brownies on a wood cook stove is way more appealing than a middle-aged woman doing it. So, (laughs) wow. What did your grandparents think about all of this? Um, that's a great question. I do know my on my maternal side, they're always at odds with each other. It's interesting because both my parents came from very secular backgrounds, um, went to public school, had on the surface what you think are normal families and just a normal life. And then for them to go this far, like fundamentalist off, and you yeah. know, yeah. So it was I remember that my grandparents were at odds with my mom, like on that side, on and off for years, you know, there were long stretches of time where I wouldn't see my grandparents. And also they lived in Texas. All Mm -hmm. my family lived in Texas and we lived in Arkansas. So there wasn't any close proximity. Um, So I'm not sure what was going on with that. I was very removed from that and not told, you know, what was taking place. But even now as an adult, now that I'm out of it, it's, it's real interesting because my grandparents still don't have anything to do with me, but now it's because I'm too worldly before I was, you know, far that and too conservative, but now, Ooh, I have tattoos and I have been just, I've really gone off the deep end. So I like me and my son don't have family. Like we don't have, um, we have my brother, who got out and my nephew, um, but they have like a really interesting life. They have a camper and they're traveling the world and just living a really fun, carefree life, which I, which I think is just beautiful. But other than that, me and my son are just like, just kind of chilling on our own because our family thinks like we are heathen and we're so backslidden and I couldn't be happier. (laughs) Right. The dark side is pretty great. (laughs) At least in my experience. Yeah. I think of it sometimes I get really salty because I'm like, my, no, I'm like, my son deserves like grandparents and people involved in his life and like a support system. I feel like I'm a big girl. I can handle it because I know why they're not in my life. But for him, I'm like, all of his friends have grandparents or they'll go on trips or have yeah. Christmases. And my son doesn't get any of that. And that just, it just makes me so angry and so sad. But I'm like, he's the oldest grandchild. He was the first one mm. on both sides. And still he's just like, it's just me and him, you know? <laughs> so yeah. He, he deserves better than that. But I would rather it, it, us, it be just us and us have a healthy environment without yes. all of that just toxicity than trade that for a big, horrible, abusive family. Exactly. I was just going to say, I'm sure if you were to ask him, which do you prefer? He'd be like, mom, I'm set with just you. <laughs> like, this is yeah. great. We, <laughs> I don't need any of that. Of course. He's really eased into the only child lifestyle. Right. He probably loves it. Um, Yeah, mm-hmm. I'm sure it's hard not having that extended family. And and if he has friends who enjoy that side of the family, but also you can 
have a chosen family, right? You probably surround yourself with friends and people who do love and support you. And I think that's more important if it means being on the trajectory of a healthier life instead of one that is full of misery and pain. So yes, (laughs) well done. Couldn't agree more. So I think we can jump into then when you escaped, at what point did you realize I cannot live here anymore? And how were you able to get yourself out? Yeah, one of my followers asked that the other day they said you know what what was that moment where you decided i have to get out i have to leave like what was that moment and i i don't know i don't have a particular moment that comes to mind because i feel like it was just a compounding like years and years of all of these moments building up like i couldn't take anymore Mm -hmm. and so in my later teen years we actually moved to a place with electricity, with with running water, kind of back in what would seem like normal-ish, still very conservative. I was still not allowed to date, had to wear dresses, couldn't wear makeup, couldn't date. Um, I wasn't allowed to get my driver's license until I was 18, even though, of course, the boys, boys are given much better privileges than girls in this cult environment. And so the boys were, the boys got their driver's license 15, 16, So I had to be very calculated as much as I wanted out. And I knew that I wanted out. I unfortunately, and it made me feel really like icky because you're told constantly to honor and respect your parents. Mm -hmm. And here I was feeling like I had to do things incognito in order to make the plans for my escape. So on one hand, I was like, I have to do this. I know I want to do it. I'm dead set. I'm going to do it. And on the other hand, I feel like I'm you know, displeasing God by disrespecting my parents and doing things that they wouldn't approve. So once we moved back into the real world, I actually started college when I was a senior in high school, but here's, (laughs) it was a community college and get this shit. My mom enrolled in every class that I was taking so she could essentially chaperone me and make me make sure I wasn't doing anything I shouldn't do. I'm not, I'm not shitting you. So I was never taught sex ed, of course, anything about about that growing up. So the first thing I learned about even the human reproductive system was in anatomy and physiology with my mother. (laughs) So good times. Um, So I started taking college classes and uh, my parents had told me that I could go to college. She had to be there, but I had to, I I was not given a choice. I had to go into the medical field um, or, you know, get married and start a family. So I was like, okay, I guess I'll do the medical field. So when I started college, I started taking all of the courses directing me towards like a nursing degree. Um, So I also knew, again, I was like 17 at the time. So I knew that if I ran away, then legally in the state of Arkansas, they, the cops would be able to bring me back home. Mm -hmm. So I was like, I have to wait till... I'm 18. I have to be strategic. So I did. I I worked as like a, an assistant at the college while I was taking classes. So like the, the I forget what they call it. What do they call it? When Student teacher? Yeah, something like that. So I did get paid just like an hourly minimum wage um, and kind of stashed that money. So then I bought like a track phone, like those old like Nokia track phones that got confiscated a couple times because they're always going through my room, always keeping tabs on all my stuff. So that happened a couple times. And then eventually, you know, I got a phone and was able to contact somebody to pick me up. And I waited again until I turned 18, until I was allowed to get my driver's license at 18. I didn't have a car, but I had my license. I had to Um, When my parents were out of the house, sneak into their rooms, go through the documents, find my birth certificate, Mm. my social security card, and just be very calculated about, okay, I don't really know what I'm going to need out in the real world, but I know I'm going to need these couple of things. And I'm so grateful I did that because when I left and my mom found out I had left, she threw away everything of mine, like immediately wrote me out of her life. Like, I'm like, I kept years and years of journals all of that gone, all of my personal possessions, granted wasn't much, but still just the fact that she could write me off so easily Mm -hmm. and essentially rid me out of her life is, I mean, shouldn't be surprising, but at the time it, it definitely hurt. So the day I left, actually, it was a Sunday and I just, I pretended to be sick. So my family went to service when they went to church and I was like, I'm not feeling well. I don't think I can do it. I'm feeling nauseous, whatever. I'm going to stay home. I don't remember exactly what I said. But um, so I stayed behind and I wrote a note 
and left it on the kitchen table, basically saying like, hey, I'm gone. I'm not coming back. Don't look for me. Um, <laughs> peace out, basically. And I put a bunch of my items in a big black garbage bag, just some clothes and um, a scrapbook, I think, and my documents. And then I had someone pick me up and take me to Missouri. Um, and that person I ended up actually marrying two weeks later, mind you, I hadn't been allowed to date. Right. So I only, I had known this person from previous years when our families went to church together. So his family was still very much in this exact same cult. We went to this exact same church, but he had left. So he was quite a bit older than me and he had left years prior and had moved to Missouri. So I thought he was out, right? Right. Like I thought he was far removed from it, but we had only been speaking for a couple of weeks via text. And so what could I possibly know about this person? Not much, only what he chose to tell me. So he drove down from Missouri, picked me up. We went back to Missouri. I married him two weeks later and I've talked about this on my channel, but I remember like walking down the aisle in a borrowed wedding dress with like, it it literally cost us less than a hundred dollars to do this. And I remember walking down the aisle thinking, I'm going to divorce this person. (laughs) And that's so shitty. It's so shitty. But I, I genuinely, from the bottom of my heart, like I wish that I could, I wish that I could express how much. I didn't feel like I had a choice. I was like, if I don't marry this person and he wants me to marry him, then I will have to go back home. I won't have any, I won't have any any place to stay. I don't have any. Yeah. And um, real quick to add, I had that money that I was saving from working that job. I had a bank account and my mom was on that bank account. And the day I left, not only did she get rid of all my stuff, but she immediately went to the bank and cleaned out my bank account. So and for I, I guess I hadn't thought that one through. Um, so like I left on a Sunday. I think that Monday he took me to the bank to get my cash out and it was completely zero balance. Mm. And so I, so that even furthered my thinking of like, I literally have no money. I have no money. I don't, I live in a completely new state with this person who I don't hardly, I barely know. So I don't have a choice. I have, like, I have to marry him. I didn't think. I didn't think I had another choice, right? I have some questions for you. Yeah. Ask. So this guy, you thought that he left the cult, but he also knows your state of mind because you are literally escaping for your life. And he still, knowing where you were coming from, asked you to marry him in two weeks. So... I guess I'm wondering. He proposed. He proposed the day he picked me up. Oh my gosh. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> I guess I'm wondering. Now that you can look back at it, do you think that he knew all along that he could just coerce you into marrying him? Was there any romance there whatsoever? Did you feel like you had a connection with him, or was this just survival? You didn't know you had any options, and he took advantage of that. He 100% took advantage of that. <laughs> like I said, he was s- several years older. I was barely 18. I knew nothing of the world. He had been moved out for years living on his own. Um, you can cut this part if you want. I was obviously a virgin um, and never like, obviously never dated anyone, much less yeah. touched a man. And so he told me that the same for him, you know, he was a virgin. And then years later when we got divorced, he was, you know, Oh, I wasn't even a virgin. I'd been with plenty of women before oh you, which gosh. looking back, obviously he had that part was actually true. But, you know, I was like so naive. I was so naive. I had no, no idea. Um, and so he, yeah, absolutely took advantage. But, you know, I also feel really shitty, like marrying somebody knowing I'm going to divorce them. But I, and it's no excuse, but I just, like that's how desperate, that's what I'm trying to get at. It's like, that's how desperate your mindset is when you're trying to get out of that situation in a right. cult is literally anything sounds and looks better than staying. And that even means getting into other situations that are damaging and abusive just in a different way. Mm-hmm. This this way you're getting it from a partner and not from your parents, but it's still abusive. It's still toxic and unhealthy. Yeah, but you should also not have to defend yourself. I think I I don't think it was shitty of you to do that because you were literally in survival mode and it was shitty for him to even make that offer to you knowing what you were going through and knowing that you just needed help and for him to just swoop in and take advantage of you. That's shitty. You 
you were a victim of him. I I guess I'm just saying don't feel bad because you don't owe him anything, at least from, I don't know all the story. I don't know the whole story. But from this sure. point of view, it seems like he just completely used your naivety and wanted to swoop in and manipulate you and knew that he could. And so I just don't feel like you should feel bad for that because he knew the state of mind that you were in and yeah. he knew he could manipulate so you and he knew that he could victimize you and you were victimized. I just want to put yep. words to that, that Thank you were you. a victim in that situation. And so you shouldn't feel bad for it. Of course. Yeah. It, logically, all of that makes sense. And when I'm talking to other people about their situations, I say the exact same things. It's just, and you know, this yeah. from coming from, you know, a culty background is like, you still, even logically, when you know you were taken advantage of or you were the victim, it's still like you feel the guilt and the responsibility yeah. to own it. And it's just so fucked up. But that's that's exactly how we're raised is like, no matter what happens to you, if you're raped or sexually assaulted or whatever, it's your fault for something that you brought on yourself. Yeah. And unfortunately, that stays in your brain a long time. Even when you've unlearned those processes, it still can sneak back in. But 100%. I appreciate you saying that because you're absolutely right. Yeah, 100%. I get that. And I do the same thing with myself. And like you were saying, <laughs> it's so easy to recognize and support someone else who's going through something. But it's hard when it comes to ourselves because it also requires a lot of introspection and stillness and awareness. And that takes a lot of time to unwind. Yeah. And self-compassion and right. forgiveness. Right. Compassion. And it also shows yeah. that you're an empathetic person and you are compassionate because you're willing to even offer compassion to this guy who victimized you. You're able to say, oh man, I probably shouldn't have done that because I just knew I was going to divorce him. And that even shows the type of person that you are. So you find yourself in this situation where you just walked right back into the arms of a predator. And at what point do you realize, oh, shit, I shouldn't have done this? Immediately. Oh, man. <laughs> Immediately. Oh, God. So six weeks after we got married, I find out he has a literal porn addiction, which was, again, was like foreign to me. I don't know anything about that. So I'm like, okay, I don't really know what to do with this information. I just now I know it. Um, and then six months after being married, I got pregnant with my son. Oh, wow. I mean, obviously, this goes without saying he's the coolest fucking kid. Like, I'm extremely fortunate that out of all of the children I could have had, he, this is my child. Like, yeah. he amazes me all the time. He's incredibly smart and kind, beautiful human. That being said, at this point, this was just a cluster of cells, right, in my body. <laughs> so I lost it for about two weeks. Like, cried and cried and cried and was just like so upset with myself with the situation because I knew like I'm gonna I'm going to be tied yeah. to this person forever forever like this is I'm I felt like I'm royally fucked now mm. because uh because again divorce is always off the table divorce isn't an option and so after I got pregnant we actually moved we lived with his family for a while which again we're still very heavily in the cult so then I ended up having to go back to that same freaking church oh we're no, like at the didn't. height of my family's yes I'm not kidding you at the height of my family's like culty life we went to this particular church and his family still went there. So when we moved back when, with his family for a little while, because we were like really poor, then we ended up going back to that same freaking church. I was like, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> like, how did I end? Did you have to face your family? No. So my family had moved. Like, oh, they, remember good. they had like, oh, right. well, I don't remember, but like, yeah, I'm remembering. So they had moved a couple hours away okay. and had electricity and, and, and all that. Right. right. So um, so they lived several hours away. Yeah. So my family wasn't going to that same church, but everyone who spoke to my family, knew my family, everything, of course, still went there. So there was no privacy. I mean, every, my family obviously knew what was going on. Um, when I when I ran away, my family did my dad and my older brother before I got married, like a couple of days. So in between the two weeks when I ran away, they came up to Missouri and I can't remember the circumstances. Somehow they got a hold of me and we met at a Chili's. They're like, we just want to talk to you. We just, we just want to talk to you. So my ex and I met them at Chili's and they were trying to talk me into coming back home, trying to bring me back home. And that didn't work. I was obviously like, I'm not going to go back. But then my, I can't remember if it was my dad or my brother. One of them stands up and literally just throws their hot coffee like on me. 
like in rage, you know, so there was like that one attempt of them bringing me back home. But then after that, they they kind of like, I didn't talk to them for years. And they didn't talk to me for years. And for a while, that was great, because I'm like, I'm away from them. But then I get right back in this church where everyone's asking about my family and so happy that I'm back on the right path and following God and God's going to use this as part of my testimony and all this bullshit. Um, And then my ex's job moved us to Louisiana. So once again, within the first year of me being out of the house for the first time away from that environment, I'm in Louisiana in a brand new state. I don't know anybody. Obviously, I have my family's not talking to me. I've lost all my friends. And my ex also was, again, very much part of that that patriarchal mindset. So I had no vehicle, no job, no computer, no phone. Like I just sat in our one bedroom apartment, like the majority of my pregnancy. Um, and I had a horrible pregnancy, high risk pregnancy. Oh, no. I was um, on bed rest a lot of it. And you're just only so 18. isolated. Like I'm only 20. I'm 18 at this point. And then my first ultrasound, which I didn't go to the doctor till it's like five months. My first ultrasound, they discover that my son has a condition called gastroschisis, which is where all of his intestines are on the outside of his mm. body. So like in utero, when he's forming, his stomach didn't close. And so all of his intestines are on the outside, which is like a high risk pregnancy, a higher in risk for infection, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Um, and they said there's like nothing that you can do to cause that, nothing you can do to prevent it. It just sometimes happens with like really young first time moms, which, uh, you know, I was. Yeah. So all of that it was just like an enormous amount of stress and isolation. Um, so that was a really rough time. And then my son was born down there. And then I think when he was six weeks old, we moved back in with his parents, with my ex's parents. Oh, so geez. it was just like right back. Um, yeah, which launched me into six full months of like horrible postpartum depression mm. of just like staying in the bedroom. I wouldn't come out of the bedroom. I just stayed in there with my son and just like in the dark room and was just like horribly, horribly depressed. So, um, yeah, that's so Re- really awful. rough time. <laughs> yeah. It's not a not a good time. I'm really surprised though that your family they they weren't happy about what you did because isn't that the goal is to get married and have kids young? Wouldn't they have been proud that you would have married someone from the they same? They didn't choose church? him though. They oh, didn't choose him. That's a rule. I forgot about and he, that. And since he had left, yeah, and they everyone looked at him as being really rebellious because not only was he older, but he had moved away from the church. So right. even though he shared the same ideals, obviously, uh, like on the surface level, he was rebellious because he moved like two hours away from the church and was like, just, you know, backslidden, apparently. Okay. So no, they weren't they weren't happy because it wasn't their choice. I did it on my own accord, not because that's who they wanted me to marry. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, that's rebellion and Compl- very frowned upon. <laughs> right. And for those who don't know, in IBLP teachings, the Institute and Basic Life Principles, uh, you basically have to court someone. You're not allowed to date. So each family has to decide, yes, you can court my daughter. Yes, I will accept you to court, you know. So you have to get permission and they say it's kind of like an arranged marriage. You can only court with the intent of marrying. So no dating. Correct. So that makes sense. And one thing that I remember from the Shiny Happy People documentary is within the Pearl's books or the the book to train up a child, they mentioned that there is no age limit and that you can discipline a wife even. So was your husband doing that to you? Yeah. So before I get into that, you're absolutely right. There's really no age limit. And I remember my parents disciplining me well into my late teen years, um, even. And yeah, so absolutely. My parents were no different. They disciplined us like until we were essentially adults. My son's dad was (laughs) um, more clever, I would say, and more uh, because I wasn't his child, so he had to be a little bit more careful about how that abuse took place because now there was a child in the mix and I did take my son to the doctor and I would go in public in in a lot more frequency than I did when I lived at home. Mm -hmm. And so, especially with my son's condition, like I just had to be in public more often and and around doctors and people who could absolutely report it. So his, his types of abuse were less about leaving marks and more about 
um, controlling and me being submissive and me knowing my place. Like one thing that's eternally burned in my brain is he told me one time, all you're good for is cooking, cleaning, and sex. Jeez. And <laughs> so that, and that's, that was the expectation is, you know, make babies and you better have a hot meal on the table every time I come home. And so, um, the abuse was very, very psychological and con uh, controlling, like I said, where I couldn't have it uh, for years or for a while, couldn't have a job or things out in the public or anything that would give me any indication that what he was doing was not okay. Mm. So, I mean, there would be physical moments of like holding me down or subduing me, things like that, but not to leave a mark. Yeah. If that makes sense. Cause he knew. Oh, it just breaks my heart that you escaped one situation and walked right back into another immediately. Like you had no time to acclimate to the real world or even understand, like you said, if this was right or wrong. I mean, you knew it was uncomfortable, of course, but that's all that you knew. So how would you know how to really fight for yourself? But you did have a little bit yeah. of a fighting spirit in you <laughs> enough to leave the first time. So what was it that got you to leave this situation? Yeah, I got some spunk in here. It's always yeah. been in there. The, 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 the bad the child. My spirit. family has always called me. Yeah. <laughs> my family's always called me the bad child. And so I was like, well, if they're going to call me that, I'm going to live up to it. So um, my son, my son is the reason I left the second time. And it's because I, I just knew, I knew in my gut, I was like, okay, I now have a boy and that boy is going to be like his dad and like his uncles which he had like his dad had like six or seven brothers and so i'm like he's in this environment he's obviously that's just how nature versus nurture right mm -hmm. like he's going to be exactly like the people he's around and so um my ex was working on the road for a while and one of those times he told me that he was having an affair and i was like well my time has come this is my chance to escape you know and so um because before it was like all of this stuff is happening. But again, I don't, it's so normalized, even though I'm, like you said, I'm very uncomfortable. I'm like, I don't want to live like this. This is not okay with me personally. Mm -hmm. But the way they have you believe is it's not about you. You're trained exactly like that book. Like you're trained from the, from the get go, your desires, your comfortability, your consent does not matter. Yeah. And that doesn't just change overnight. It takes so many years. And so at that point it was like, you know, I, I don't want to be in this, but I don't feel like I have enough to leave. But when he told me he was cheating on me, I was like, okay, even though divorce is frowned upon, regardless of cheating, I was like, I, I can't, not only is my son going to be like, um, Patriarchal. like following the patriarch mindset, mm -hmm. but like, he's, he's also now having this demonstration of an adulterous father. <laughs> so yeah. I was like, okay, I, I can't do this. Like I, I wrestled with it and wrestled with it. And I'm like, I cannot, I cannot do this. Like I can't raise my son to be like this. Like what kind of mother would I be if I let this happen? And so it's one thing to allow abuse to happen to yourself, but as a mother, like, or as a parent, you, there's just like this just such a strong pull to protect your child, yeah. which again, I, which is why I can't understand why my parents did what they did to their own children. But, um, so it was just like this, just such a strong pull. Like I have to get out of this. So I did, I filed for divorce and, um, just immediately got just, just blasted with hate from the church and the cult and the family about, you know, I, I was expected to still stay with him because that's what's taught is like abuse and adultery is not a reason to leave. Wow. If he's cheating on you, it's because you're not meeting his needs in some capacity. It's oh, your fault. No. So you need to do better as a wife. Like you're obviously driving him to do it. And so, um, I filed for divorce when my son was, I think my son was about a year old at that point. So it didn't take me long yeah. after being with this person or he might have been a year and a half. I, I apologize. I don't remember the exact timeline, but I applied for nursing school. And so I started nursing school the same month that I filed for divorce. So I was a single mom. I had to work. Wow. I was working three jobs in nursing school full time, completely alone, no family, no friends. Like it was so now like that's my that's my like perspective. If I ever feel overwhelmed and stressed out, I'm like, girl, like <laughs> 
do you remember what you did? <laughs> like you can, this is nothing compared to that. But it was never, it was never in my mind at that point. It never crossed my mind to go back. Like I never for one second thought I can't do this. And I like, I'm going to have to stay with him or I'm going to have to go back to my family. I was just like, so dead set, just so in that survival mode mindset, like this has to work and I'm not going to give it a chance to not work. So I just was like, okay, we're like we're doing this. So, you know, we, we got through it and we did it. And I, you know, was the first person in my family to have a college degree. So my degree is in nursing. Um, and so we, we got through it, but God, it was like, (laughs) I wouldn't wish that on anybody. So now that's kind of like my mission and my goal now with sharing my story is not just sharing my story because I need to get it off of my chest, but it's, being able to provide resources and information and guidance and knowledge with so many other women and other individuals leaving the same situations. Because even though I survived that and I made it work and I got through it and quote unquote successful now, I don't think everyone else needs to suffer too, to get to that point. Like there's no reason people should have to go through that type of hardship to get the freedom they innately deserve. So that's exactly how I want to use my platform and speaking and my voice for speaking is to be able to give opportunity and resources and um um support for other survivors trying to leave similar or you know other domestic uh, domestic abuse situations girl you are an inspiration let me tell you that is incredible (laughs) you just like got up and (laughs) thank you you just got up and left single mom put yourself through nursing school with no family no friends no support i'm just in awe that you were able to achieve that and just become the amazing person that you are now because what you went through was a lot and that was just no child should have to deal with that and no adult should have to deal with that. And I'm just so happy that you have found your peace and I'm sure it's still hard and you're still working through it. But the fact that you are putting in so much effort to yourself and your son, I'm sure is thriving because of it. And you have an amazing partner and I'm just so proud of what you've been able to accomplish. That's truly, truly amazing. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, You know, people often comment on my videos and say, well, I'm so glad you got out, but you know, look at the type of person it's made you today. And I would like to tell everyone to please stop saying that to victims because we could have become amazing people without the abuse and the trauma. We don't need that to become fantastic individuals. Children don't need resilience to be wonderful people when they grow up. We don't need to go through everything. I became a wonderful person and a successful person despite the trauma, but not because of the trauma. Yes. I'm so glad that you said that. (laughs) And I love it so much. I hear the same thing oftentimes. And and honestly, when I hear that from other survivors, it breaks my heart a little because I never want someone to feel grateful for their trauma. They can be grateful for their strength and their resilience and their perseverance, but not... It's not the trauma who made you who you are. It was you who got yourself through that. You're the one who rose above it. And just like you said, nobody needs that in order to become a great person and to help other people. Correct. It's just we have a little bit more of a different perspective to help those in a different way. Yes, absolutely. We have something that allows us to relate a little bit more with compassion But that's not to say that you have to go through trauma to become someone amazing. And I used to think that all the time, actually. I remember (laughs) when I got into more spiritual stuff and they would platform these people who have abuse stories and it almost felt like they were celebrating the abuse stories because of what they went through. And I can understand that it's a fine line, um, but I really don't think we should be celebrating the Mm -hmm. abuse story, we should be highlighting it so that others won't go through something similar or they can help get themselves out of it or other people can help get other people out of it. But it's not your abuse story that makes you great. It's you as a person. It's your, like I said, your perseverance, your ability to shine anyway in spite of the abuse. So, correct. yes. 
praise. I will join the cult of Kendra <laughs> with that as our motto. <laughs> I'm about to go buy me a pulpit and start preaching. On <laughs> preach, girl. <laughs> preach. You got the platform now. You can do it. Right. <laughs> and I'm never going to shut up about it. Yes. And you shouldn't. And what is your consciousness now? What is your flip side of the story? What makes you happy, whole, at peace? That's a great question. Um, I I did recently talk about this on my platform as well, because that is the like hands down number one question I get asked is, so do you still believe in God? Mm -hmm. And what I want to be very clear on is that I do not believe in a Christian God. However, I am, I'm not angry at God. And I did not come to this conclusion because of the way I was raised. Mm -hmm. I feel like how I was raised got me to that conclusion quicker, actually, because it launched me into my own reading and my own digging into what I actually do believe and what resonates with my own soul, not mm -hmm. just what's being handed down to me and taught to me um, via my someone else's beliefs, because the beliefs that were given to me, and this happens with generations everywhere, is you believe what your parents believe, what their parents believe, what their parents yeah. believe. But what do you actually believe? What, at the end of the day, resonates with your soul and is not just something that you were taught to fear to believe. Yes. And so what what I've come to is I I absolutely believe in universal consciousness and a higher power that is not in the form of a Jesus or God as, you know, Christianity depicts, mm -hmm. but it's more I believe that we are our own gods because we are in in charge of and we have the ability and the power to create our own individual worlds. We have the ability to create or um, live our own personal heaven or our own personal hell. And what we do with that knowledge and our ability to create our worlds is what I like. That's what I believe is we all have the individual power to do that. And so um, I guess that's more of a woo woo, <laughs> like call woo -woo uh, belief system. But um, I believe in all of the uh, laws of the universe, the law of attraction, the law of assumption, all of those types of universal laws, because I have actually witnessed them work for me. I have been able to use all of those tools that reside in myself. I'm not relying on someone else. I'm not relying on an invisible, you know, just invisible God to make things happen for me taking control over my own life and my ideas and my thoughts and my own um, energy that I put out into the world that determines how my life is. And I've seen that happen over and over and over for me. And so that's what that's what I believe. <laughs> I really love that approach to things. And I have similar views as well. I know some people, uh, they don't agree with that level of woo, but it resonates with me. And I always say people, if it doesn't resonate with you, then don't believe it. That's the beauty of it. You yep. have the option to believe whatever makes you feel comfortable and whatever fulfills your life in a certain way. And if as long as you're not hurting yourself or other people, I say go for it. So yeah. And there's also a level of power that it gives to yourself. Some people may find it blasphemous to say that we are the God within ourselves. But I also think that it's more empowering when you take control of your life instead of, uh, for example, praying to something for something to happen. Instead, you can go out and make it happen. Or when something bad happens, it relieves yourself of the pressure of thinking, what did I do to deserve this? And this mm -hmm. God is punishing me for some reason, which doesn't resonate with me. So yeah, I think that's great. Good for you. And <laughs> before we go, I need your Linda Listen moment. Sassy statement as the <laughs> toddler goes, the viral video of the toddler saying something to someone who's pissed you off or if you want to go the inspirational route, that's okay too. What do you think I'm going to do? I feel like you're going to go sassy. I really <laughs> hope you go sassy. <laughs> you know I'm going to go sassy. Yes. Lay it on me. There's, there's, there's a time to be inspiring, but you know what? This ain't it. <laughs> <laughs> Give me the sass. Linda, listen, Jesus said, suffer the little children to come unto me. He didn't say, make the little children suffer. Stop abusing kids and calling it biblical. Girl, oh, preach. And thanks a lot for the trauma. <laughs> thanks a lot for the trauma. Girl, preach. <laughs> that is so good. And I love that you pointed that out because that's one thing. And often I will say, guys, if you're out there and you're Christian and you don't follow these harmful things like the IBLP, and I know you're saying that's not Christianity, they're just crazy. I love that you want to follow Christ because I mean, God 
or Christ had a lot of good things to say. He had a lot of good teachings. He said, love one another. He said, uh, like he would go to the outcasts and the sinners and not the ones who were just the saints. And I think he had a lot of great teachings. So with that, I think there's a lot to learn if that makes you happy following Christ. And with that being said as well, if you are one of the extreme people, which you probably aren't, you wouldn't be watching this channel. <laughs> don't cherry pick, pick stuff in the Bible to use as an excuse to harm other people, because in my opinion, that's not what Jesus would want. Amen. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Love, love. It's love God and love people. That was the whole point of Jesus's teachings. Yeah. Like, let's not take it out of context, context and start abusing and repressing people. Yeah. Let's just love God and love people, whatever that means to you. Beautiful. So good. Now, do you have any final thoughts, things that you wanted to say and didn't give the chance to before we wrap up? I think the main takeaway is that life gets so much better on the other side of living that extreme life, whether you call it a cult or whether you just call it fundamentalism, whatever it identifies as, you don't have to call it a cult for it to be abusive mm -hmm. and you don't have to stay where you're being abused. So there's always help and there's resources and you know, I've been able to help a couple people already with just finding resources in their area, mm -hmm. even in Canada on on things that are available for them. And there is help. And even if that knowledge has been kept from you, you can reach out to me or, you know, other people like us. And we're always more than happy and willing to help anyone get out of this type of situation and just share the knowledge of what is available, because so much about this upbringing is keeping you from knowledge mm -hmm. because knowledge is viewed as harmful and what's harmful is the abuse that they want to keep you in. So if you are wanting to get out, please reach out to one of us and we can provide resources. Or if you know someone that's in that lifestyle, the best thing that you can do is keep yourself open and willing to help them if, or when that time comes when they do want a way out. Yeah, that's beautiful. I'm so glad you mentioned that. And guys, if you want to go follow Kendra, her Instagram at, is at the Kendra B and I'll put it on the screen. I'll put it in the description box below and any links that she gives me as far as resources go. And she's right. You are not alone. You don't have to suffer. There are options for you. And thank you so much for being here, Kendra, and sharing your story. Thank you so much for having me and for for being so supportive and to all of your followers and mine that have just absolutely just wrapped me in like this warm hug of support is I mentioned off camera earlier is I never thought anyone would care about my story. And now I have this overwhelming wave of and community of people that want to hear my story and share their very personal stories with me is just, you know, it's the biggest gift I think I've ever received. And I'm just I'm so grateful. So thank you. Yeah, of course. And guys, if you made it to the end, leave some words of encouragement down in the comments for Kendra. It means a lot. It uh, boosts the algorithm, as I mentioned before. And it's just like the best way to support is by uh, putting some activity on the video so that it gets more eyes and more visibility. And if you want to support even further financially, you can become a patron at patreon.com slash cults to consciousness. That would mean the world if you would want to support in that way. Um, but again, if not, just liking and sharing this video is extremely helpful. And if you did like this video, I'll put some videos down below here that you'll definitely want to check out. And until next time, follow your highest excitement, be conscious and be well.